So again, welcome everybody. Um, I am Arne Fittnaus, if you're on the, the global head of the KCS Academy, and that's the training and certification arm of the Consortium for Service Innovation. And so welcome to our KCS in Action webinar. And today we're going to be hearing from uh, Padma Prasad from NetApp. And Padma is the senior manager, and she heads up the digital support um, operations really focused on the Evolve Loop programs. And she's going to be presenting how um, an optimal content health and customer success is really driven by a content strategy. And she's going to talk about their successes as well as uh, what helped them achieve those successes. Uh, but some housekeeping before we begin. This session is being recorded and it's going to be posted on the KCS Academy site as well as uh, sent out to all who have registered. And this one, um, Padma and NetApp have been kind enough to make this, uh, allow this to be publicly available. So we are going to um, feel free to share the link to anybody. And then uh, Padma has also been kind enough to um, let us um, distribute a PDF of her presentation. So you're gonna be getting that also. But please put yourself on mute. And what, the way we do this in the KCS in action, if you're new to this, is please post your questions in chat. And uh, Padma's team is actually will, will be on and monitoring the chat. And they've renamed themselves to NetApp. So you're going to see that NetApp is responding to the chat. So they're either going to answer them in the chat or they're going to bring them up for the Q&A session at the end. And we should have about. 10 minutes or so for Q&A at the end to, to cover anything that wasn't answered in the chat. And I also wanna make sure you are aware of upcoming KCS Academy events. So we, we do have three uh, upcoming KCS Academy events that we have dates and we have two more that we're actually solidifying the dates, but some that we have the dates set, we have Yext, which is our newest um, Align partner and they're gonna share how an effective knowledge strategy can address the unique challenges associated with findability and discoverability. So, um, and they're using some interesting things with knowledge graphs and such. So uh, I've had uh, the opportunity going through the, um, the Align program to really understand their product and very, very interesting and in their approach that can be applied even if you're not using their product. So that one will be very interesting. And then Search Unify, is going to be presenting a case study with one of their customers. And then we have uh, Pat McBride from Oracle. He's been a, a prior presenter for KC Instant in Action. He moved from the support organization into the sales organization. And he's going to be presenting how he leveraged KCS in their um, sales environment to much success. And then we again, we do have two others that we are just solidifying the date um, and such. So we'll have those shortly. But Jennifer Mortcat, our community success manager, she's going to be posting the link in the chat to our KCS Academy events page. And so you'll be able to see all of those upcoming events. Um, and uh, encourage you to register early. And um, it's always great to hear about uh, digital transformations happening in this broader community. And when I say digital transformations, we certainly do quite a bit around KCS. But if you have a transformation about automated support, proactive support, um, how you've transformed your communities, uh, intelligence swarming, um, how you're driving um, uh, chat or chatbots, you know, all that we'd love to hear about because it's so related to the that transformation that we're all trying to do. And again, whether it be successes, um, strategies and tips, as well as ditches that you've encountered and how to avoid them, that is so valuable. So if you'd like to present at a KCS in action, please reach out to me. I'll put my contact information in chat. But I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to Padma. Thank you. Thank you, Anfin. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for giving us an update on the upcoming events. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today to present to this forum and to talk about NetApp's journey with KCS and specifically about how we have been sustaining our content health and customer success through our content strategy and best practices. I'm Padma Sai Prasad and I'm part of the digital support operations team, which uh, rolls up into the customer support and delivery org at NetApp. And today uh, in this session, I have with me some members from my direct team. I have Rajesh Panda, who is our content architect, and he's the person who's actually designed the KD site and he uh, supports all tool related enhancement requests that come in from our stakeholders. I also have with me here Nitya Shankaranarayanan, uh, 
Mohan BN and Amit Srivatsa from my editorial team, and they play a very significant role in driving our content strategy to execution. Uh, we also have Sachin Putrin, uh, he's our business analyst, and he's, one of, uh, he's the one who gives all the data that we require to make informed decisions on our content. Uh, I also have on the call Ryan Matthews, my manager, and NetApp's KCS Guru. Uh, he's the mastermind behind NetApp's successful implementation of the KCS V6 methodology. Like Anfin said, we will have time uh, at the end for questions, but if you have any questions uh, that you want to ask during the session, please ask them on chat. My team will be actively monitoring chat and answering questions on chat throughout the presentation. And with that, let me begin. So in the agenda today, of course, I'll start uh, with an introduction, a quick introduction to NetApp, to myself and to my team. Uh, we'll then get into the meat of the matter, the topic of today's discussion, which is NetApp's content, health practices and engagement techniques. And after that, we'll uh, look at some of our success measures and we'll finally wind up with some insights into what we are planning to do going forward. Okay, NetApp is, uh, we are a data centric software company headquartered in San Jose, California. We have about 11,000 employees, 4,000 partners, and we specialize in helping our customers get the most out of their data with industry leading cloud data services, storage systems, and software solutions. I have about 20 years of experience in the content space. Uh, primarily in technical documentation. I joined NetApp about four years ago, and that's where I got introduced to knowledge management, customer support, and um, knowledge and knowledge centered services, KCS. I'm currently leading the Evolu programs team that has 12, 11 members, and I'm uh, very proud to say that we are all KCS V6 certified. And we call ourselves the Evolu programs team. Now, why do we call ourselves the Evolu programs team? And that is because uh, my team and we manage uh, much more than just NetApp's knowledge base. We spearhead many aspects of the KCS program. We manage all the data that is required for the Evolve Loop work, uh, and we, we pass it on to the knowledge domain experts team. We work very closely with them. We drive strategic content initiatives to improve the usability and findability of our high-valued uh, knowledge articles. There are a couple of folks in my team who coordinate the content center, uh, the content standard checklist, and the um, a process adherence review audit processes and they maintain the audit data that the entire KCS team uses for coaching purposes and to drive the right behaviors to sustain the KCS program. A part of my team also works on continuously improving our support uh, chatbot. We have a chatbot called ELIO and uh, a part of my team does sustenance activities on uh, ELIO and this is based off customer interactions with the bot. We also maintain and manage digital support, uh, digital support social media touch points, which is our, our YouTube channel. It's called KBTV, and we also have our own Facebook page and Twitter handle. So clearly, there's a lot that we do as a team uh, to support our customers and the larger KCS team. Uh, here, I also want to give a quick brief about the KCS team we support, and here we are. I'm, I'll be speaking specifically to the level two support. Uh, we have, uh, you know, about 90% of our level two uh, technical support engineers are licensed as publishers or contributors. Uh, we have about 23% of our uh, level two engineers as coaches, and 7% of our level two team are uh, part of the KDA program. And we have about uh, 50 KCS V6 certified practitioners at NetApp that help drive our program to success across different shows. So clearly, we are quite a KCS team to reckon with. Now coming to the topic of the day, we, we're going to talk about, you know, how we've been driving engagement. Now, we all know as KCS practitioners this, that uh, in KCS content is king, right? But what is it that makes content the king? We can have great content out there, but if our customers are not engaging with it effectively, it remains an insignificant pawn, like the background images we see on the screen here. It's only when content shows up at the right place, at the right time, to the right audience, does it have the right impact which is to help our customers get the information they want with the least effort. Therefore, it is customer engagement with content that makes content the king, that makes it reign supreme. And today's discussion is all about how we at NetApp are driving successful engagement with our customers while continuing to create customer-centric content that is propelling our shift left strategy. Now, what is our shift left strategy? It's our conscious effort to shift our customers to our digital channels of support for self-serviceable solutions and have them contact traditional support that is assisted support only for new and complex issues. Sorry. Okay, before I get to the details of our content health strategy, I wanted to show you what we have achieved in the last 20 months, which, uh, which I believe 
uh, is the direct impact of a carefully crafted strategy. I want to start today's discussion with what we were able to achieve before talking about how we accomplished it. Uh, one of the primary measures of NetApp digital support is to evaluate how often digital is part of our customer support journey. And we see that 98% of our customers start their support journey through one of our digital channels of support. And we've been able to maintain that for nearly two years now. In correlation with that, we've seen a 75% increase in our overall traffic to the KB site, 55% increase in our contact ratio. And for those of you who are uh, who are new to the term contact ratio. This is the ratio of digital support engagement or web sessions for every assisted support case that is open in our support center. We've also seen a 50% increase in Google traffic to our KB site, an 18% increase in our customer effort score, which is the percentage of customers rating our site as very easy or somewhat, uh, somewhat easy to use. And this score has significantly improved in the last 20 months. And we've also seen a 10% increase in our click-through rate. Now, these were some of the metric, uh, metric improvements that we've been seeing in the last uh, 20 months. But the cherry on the top happened last, uh, last month when we won our first industry recognition award, the CX1 Expert Award for KCS and the Most Admired Award. Now, uh, the KCS Award we won for excellence in practice of the KCS methodology and the Most Admired Award, which is a um, peer recognition award, uh, was given to us by by the other nominees, uh, other companies that were nominated for this uh, CX1 Expert Award for our leadership and success within the CX1 Expert customer community. Now that I've given you a brief of what we've been able to achieve, uh, you know, through our strategy, I'll get into what, how we did it, right? As KCS practitioners, we're all quite aware of the content health best practices prescribed in the KCS V6 practices guide. And I've just taken a screenshot of that just to set the context and um, you know, set the tone for our discussion today. In the next half hour or so, I'll take you through how we at NetApp adapted the KCS V6 principles, practices, and techniques to strategically align with our program goals and to drive uh, customer engagement and employee satisfaction. I'll begin with how we migrated our legacy content to a demand-driven approach. I'll then uh, take you through how we improved our tools and templates to make it easy for our support engineers to create customer-centric content in the solve loop. Once we had the right tools and processes in place to create good and relevant content, it was important to ensure that we kept our content current and updated. So we built a robust and customized feedback workflow that ensured quick tracking and closure of all feedback that we received and a 48 hour turnaround time for customer feedback. Now that we had a steady and strong solve loop in place, we set up processes and practices to improve our high value content uh, as part of our evolve loop strategy. We continuously monitor our content uh, and we innovate and optimize our high value content. Finally, I'll talk about how we, um, how we subtract from our knowledge base by archiving unused and obsolete uh, content to keep our knowledge base agile and clutter free. I'll be talking about each of these practices in detail in the session today. So starting with our um, legacy content, right? How did we manage our legacy content? Now, one of the initial discussions that we had when we were getting uh, KCS basics ready was to think about uh, how, how can we effectively migrate our content from the old platform to the new one? And uh, we had more than 25,000 articles in our old database and our previous attempts at migrating the entire database into a um, new platform had taught us that it is not probably the wisest thing to mi migrate content as is uh, from the old database to the new one. Because cleaning up formatting issues and managing content that is not written the cases we can take up way more time, resources, uh, money and energy than creating a new database with a small set of highly used relevant content. So we made a bold decision and we made a decision to only migrate 20% of our legacy content to the new database. And that too, we migrated it manually by rewriting each of the identified articles the KCS way into the new platform. Some of this content was rewritten by my team, the Evolu programs team, and the, uh, some of the, the rest of it was written by our support engineers as part of their KCS V6 training requirements. Now, although uh, we did not migrate almost 80% of our legacy content, we did make sure that these migrated legacy KBs were available and easily accessible uh, to our, by our support engineers within the new content management system. So if there was a requirement to use this knowledge to solve uh, a case, uh, they could easily find it and use it and, of course, reinstate it into the new platform if required for future use. 
like I said, it was a bold decision and it was important to keep our stakeholders in the loop. So we did send out regular communication to our internal and internal and external uh, uh, stakeholders, customers, uh, informing them of our upcoming change. And when we actually went live with the changes, we went live with our new platform in May of 2020. We had actually set up a channel for our customers, partners and internal stakeholders to reach out to us and inform, of, in, inform us of any content that they are missing that they were you know, using very frequently uh, in the old database. And once they contacted us about that content, we worked, the Evolve Loop team worked on reinstating this KB into the new database within 48 hours of receiving the request. That really helped us build trust uh, with our users and with our customers. At this point, I also want to call out that in hindsight, we felt that we could have actually migrated much less than 20% of our legacy article into the new database, maybe 10 or even 5% from the old platform to the new, uh, new one, because we did not get too many customer requests to reinstate old content. And even engineers, uh, while working on cases, did not have to rewrite too many KBs from the old database based on the cases that we're seeing in the support center. Now, once we had our strategy in place for our legacy content, we wanted to ensure that we have the right tools and processes in place to continue creating customer centric content in the solve loop. We, of course, had invested in an easy to use editor. Again, uh, uh, apart from that, we had rewritten our content standards, created customer centric uh, templates to make it easy for our support engineers to capture content, uh, ca capture the content and customers context and the required information, in the right sections to build a good knowledge article. Apart from that, we had also integrated, we also integrated uh, our solve loop templates within the CRM to help our engineers seamlessly contribute knowledge to the database while working on a case. Uh, if you can see the image here, you'll see how uh, the cases work in progress article templates are integrated into the uh, CRM. The engineers can fill the appropriate sections in the work in cases with template and then contribute to the, uh, contribute to the, contribute the knowledge to the knowledge base as they are closing a case and resolving the issue. Now, what did this integrated approach result in? Like I said, in May of 2020, we went live with our new database and we went live with 5,000 articles. Today, we have close to 23,000 articles in our knowledge base. Our, our, our article create rate has gone up by five times from our pre-KCS days where the systems were not integrated and the support engineer had to move uh, out of the CRM into the uh, C, uh, CMS or the editor to create content related to a case. And mind you, we are talking here only about creates. Our edits and improves have also uh, significantly increased after we moved into the new system. More than 20, uh, more than 90% of our uh, articles are available externally and indexed by Google as compared to 55% uh, that was available to Google in the old system. So we had a 35% increase as soon as we moved into the new system. Our power percentage is um, maintained at 85% or above across all geos and our and our content standard checklist score is maintained at 90% and above across all shows. So definitely, I think we did, a, we, we did the right um, uh, uh, moves when we thought about the strategy to move only 5K articles into the system and build an integrated system to help further our solve loop activities. Now coming to feedback management and collective ownership. Collective ownership is the key concept in KCS, as we all know, and it takes the right tools, coaching, and reinforcement to bring that change to the mindset of an engineer. Prior to KCS, in, uh, KCS implementation, we functioned such that the original author of the article was considered the owner of the article, and all article improvement requests were directed to that one person, which many a times led to the feedback addressal either being delayed or eventually being discarded, especially if the author had left the company or moved to a new role. It was just not effective and our unaddressed and pending feedback were piling up for us. Shifted today, we have stopped sending feedback to the original author and we have unleashed the power of the collective. Anyone who uses the article can improve or flag the article based on the license level and our custom built feedback workflow helps us assign and track feedback effectively within our tools. Here are some visuals to show you how our feedback system works. In the image on the top left, you can see our uh, floating feedback widget, which is available to all knowledge base users, and it allows them to send us feedback on our articles. If you are a support engineer, then uh, you can either flag the article or depending on, a, on your license level, fix the issue right away. If a support engineer is actually using an article that has already been uh, th that already has a feedback to be addressed, uh, they are alerted of that and they can actually go in there, uh, look at what feedback is available for the article and go and uh, fix the article uh, before they use it uh, in their case. 
Now, if an engineer is accessing the article via the CRM, which is usually the case, there is a flag right there on the article alerting the engineer of a pending feedback for that article. So the engineer can either address the feedback and update the article before they use it, or at least they are alerted that there is a feedback on an article that they intend to use. As you see, we've really made it easy for our engineers to practice collective ownership and our tools and processes help facilitate this behavior. Additionally, we also have a, a feedback dashboard, which is maintained by the Evolve Loop team to keep track of all the incoming feedback and assign any pending feedback to appropriate vertical KDEs to address. Now this, now this entire uh, feedback process and how, and how it works was a brainchild of the KCS team and the Evolve Loop programs team. The only thing that MindTouch editor provided us with was the feedback widget on each article that would allow uh, you know, uh, our customers or uh, our users to send uh, us feedback uh, on an article and that would be emailed to a predefined email group. The rest of the process of channeling the feedback into the dashboard uh, so that we can drive relevant action and providing various touch points uh, to alert the engineers of pending feedback was completely built and customized by the Evolu programs team and our IT team. And what was the impact of this uh, you know, robust feedback uh, process? Our customer feedback doubled in the last six months. Our total feedback, internal and external, increased by 30%. I think that was because customers felt that they were listened to and you know, uh, their feedback was actioned upon, that they started interacting more uh, with our content. So our engagement, the customer's engagement with content increased because of our uh, you know, quick feedback addressing. Uh, again, our feedback turnaround time reduced to less than 48 hours from several days, uh, that was in our pre-KCS days. And we've also seen a significant number of, uh, significant improvement in the number of positive feedback that we've been uh, receiving. Now I'll move to our Evolve Loop practices. What do we do uh, with our high value content? How do we refine it? And we do that uh, actually by working very closely with our knowledge domain uh, experts team. Of course, the first, T, uh, for the first step is to identify our high value content, which again is an important responsibility of the Evolve Loop team. We run regular reports to identify our top used content, which means content that has high views or content that has been uh, uh, used very often in resolving cases. Uh, they're actually attached to cases by our engineers when they uh, uh, solve a case, and so they're also called citations. This data is then shared with the knowledge domain experts to action upon, which then translates into either improved processes in the SOL loop, product enhancements, or content enhancements, where we try and increase the findability and usability of our high value content through optimization and innovation, um, through optimization efforts and innovation, innovative content formats. I will talk in detail uh, in the next few slides about our uh, innovative content formats and our optimization strategies. Here's a glimpse of our uh, innovative content formats. These content formats were designed to increase the usability of our most relevant and high, highly valued content. The image you see on top is a snapshot of one of our interactive workflows. Our interactive workflows provide our users a guided path to reach the right content that they're looking for based on the issue that they're facing. And if they then want to choose another path or another issue uh, to look at, they can easily, easily switch to that path without uh, actually uh, losing the uh, sight of the entire workflow. The idea here was to give our uh, users the view of the entire, all, all the navigation options and give them a seamless experience to look at multiple aspects of an issue without having to leave the current page. Now, an interesting feature about our interactive workflows is that when a user reaches the content that they're interested in viewing, which is you know, the last, um, last list of content where they can actually go to the content and view the content, if it is a KB article, they can actually view that article from within the workflow. They will not be thrown into a new tab. They will not, uh, they will not, the, they will not be directed to open it into, in a new tab or a new, new window. They can view this article within this workflow uh, in a touch point that looks like an iframe. The images below are our resolution guides. Now, our resolution guides provide our customers the convenience of finding articles related to one topic or a common theme within a single piece of content. So think of it more as a, a repository of similar issues or issues to a specific product or a specific version of a product. Now, for both these formats, we've been uh, getting good feedback from our uh, customers and we've also been getting you know, um, inputs on how we can improve it. So our, our idea is to continue with such formats and also refine it as we go ahead. 
Videos are another great medium to increase engagement and statistics show that viewers re retain 95% of a message when they watch it in a video compared to a text format where the retention is only 10%. So we do, um, you know, add videos, we do, we do convert some of our top used content into videos, uh, especially content that have complex configuration and, uh, and if there are uh, complex troubleshooting KVs. Okay, now I'll quickly take you all through our optimization techniques. And as I said earlier, we have both inbound strategies and outbound strategies. And again, optimizing our content is another primary responsibility of the editors of the Evolved team. Our, uh, at this point, I, I just wanted to clarify one thing that our editors are not part of the review process in the SOL loop. We do not, uh, uh, you know, interfere anywhere in the SOL loop. But we are constantly reviewing articles in the evolve loop, especially top used uh, articles or frequently used articles to see how we can uh, constantly improve them. So our editors are involved in rewriting top used content that don't meet our content standards. They improve the content formatting. They do regular language editing on top used content and uh, they do optimization work on top used content like uh, changing the metadata description, adding metadata descriptions where they, where they don't exist so that the content is easily findable by our search engines. They are involved in uh, running SEO and accessibility audits using tools like Google Analytics, SEMrush, and Site Improve, and they address any content issues that they find on the site, which includes broken links and duplicate content. In fact, SEMrush is a very good tool to use if you want to find any kind of duplicates in your site on your site. Uh, SEMrush actually helps us identify content with the uh, same information in the body, or if they have same titles, or even if they have same metadata descriptions. We run these audits once a month, and then we fix the issues that we find in the audit results. That is our inbound strategies. Uh, we also, uh, you know, push content out to the uh, to the right platform so that our, uh, you know, our users can have easy access to that content. So the team is also involved in outbound strategic work where we display our highly used content on uh, our content that we know is in, is in high demand uh, on our community and social media touch points. We also uh, use uh, videos, uh, video campaigns and newsletters to inform our customers about uh, the site and what they can find on the site. We do have weekly Facebook posts, we have Twitter posts, and we also promote our content offerings like our new content formats or top used content or recently updated content on our KB homepage. And that brings us to our final slide on content strategy, which talks about the power of subtraction. I've so far been talking about the additions that we've made to our site, and now I'll talk about, you know, why we also need to think about subtracting content from the site. When I started this discussion, I spoke about how we made the bold decision to not migrate 20,000 articles from our old database, and that probably was our first strategy of subtraction. And we continue to reap the benefits of that decision even today as we now have a clean new knowledge base with customer-centric content. 90% of our, context is, our content is indexed by Google, plus our content is driving good engagement for us. Now, as the number of articles in our system has uh, steadily started increasing, we, are now th we, st we started thinking about how we can weed out old and unused content from our database. To do that, we identified specific archival criteria for each of our knowledge domains, of course, in collaboration with our knowledge domain experts. And uh, very recently, we just finished our first bulk archival activity where we archived close to 450 articles from the knowledge base, uh, thereby, you know, consequently providing our customers with a cleaner and decluttered site. As we did with our legacy content, support engineers have access to our archived content. So if they need to, uh, you know, um, use our archived content for any case that they are solving, uh, if they use it once, then we immediately reinstate that knowledge article into the active knowledge base in anticipation for future usage. Now, when I started the presentation, I'd shown you uh, some of our achievements of the, over the last couple of years. I had uh, shown you our percentage increases. In the next slide, I'll be actually putting some numbers there uh, to show you, you know, uh, what, what, what kind of successes did we see, the actual numbers, right? I'll start with some of our customer engagement measures. I'd earlier spoken about how our traffic to our site had increased considerably in the last uh, couple of years. Just to get some numbers around it, we have more than uh, 3.5 million page views on a monthly basis on all our digital properties. And I'm talking about all digital properties, not just KB site. If you look just at the KB site, there's a uh, more than 600k page views that we get on a monthly basis to our KB site. Our digital support contact ratio, which I said earlier, had uh, had seen a 55% increase. Is uh, if you look at the actual contact ratio that we have, it is greater than 60 to 1. And for those folks 
who um, you know are not very familiar with that team term again uh, contact ratio is the ratio of the digital support engagement or web sessions that we see on a digital property for every assisted support case that is launched in our support center we also look at uh, our 8585 metrics uh, rule right i know this is something that has been decommissioned by the consortium but we get some insights for, uh, from from this uh, measure so we do still keep uh, track of this measure this refers to the uh, percentage of customers that start their journey on uh, online and the percentage of customers that actually uh, find success with digital support. We estimate that 98% of our customers' journey starts on digital platforms and of that, 60% of them find success on digital platforms. And this is a very conservative number because this success is measured on a, uh, on a, sample, uh, on a sample basis. Our aspirational goal indeed to reach 85% uh, with the second measure, but um, considering the complexity of our products, uh, it, it, is, it is definitely an aspiration goal. And uh, however, we do continue to chase it and we hope to uh, you know, achieve it in the long term. Now coming to our now coming to our self-service measures. Uh, we get uh, so so if you look at the first two uh, measures that I talk about here, we get that from our customer service. The uh, first measure is the measure of the quality of our site. 96% of our customers have rated our site as good or of excellent quality. And 98% of our customers have rated uh, the uh, ease of use of, site, uh, of our site as very or somewhat easy to use. We have another metric that we track very closely and that's the cost per, uh, cost per answer metric. And uh, we, what we do here is we try to put a monetary value to the answers we provide through our different channels of support. We currently have four established channels of support. The first one is our assisted support channel. The next being our one-to-many channel, which includes our support site and our KB site. We have our peer-to-peer -peer support channel with our community platform, and then we have our det detected predict channel. We are bringing a fifth channel of support. That is, we are bringing in our fifth channel of support. That is our in-product support, where we are working towards giving our customers support options from within the product. Our cost per answer metric evaluates the interactions and successes of each, each of these channels and gives a dollar value per answer on each of these channels, which we then roll up into one number. Our long term goal is to get our cost per answer below hundred uh, below ten dollars, excuse me, below ten dollars when our fifth channel of support comes becomes operational. Just to give you a perspective uh, of our CPA journey, when we started, the number was quite high. This year's goal was to keep it under fifteen dollars, but our long term goal is to keep it down to a single digit value. And of course, we've been an award-winning support site for five years now. We've won, um, I think, four ASP awards uh, uh, in, in, four, in, in, in the last four years. We've won STV awards, and our recent, of course, award win uh, that we won was our CX1 Expert Awards. So quite, uh, a, you know, a lot of uh, a proud moment for all of us. Now, looking ahead, I finally want to close this session by talking about our future initiatives. Up until recently, our KDA activities, uh, KDA activity was a part-time initiative that some of our knowledge experts were involved in. But now we have a fully fleshed KDA continuity team that works on strategically strengthening our uh, KCS capabilities. The Evolu programs team uh, closely collaborates with the KDA team, as I, meant, as I mentioned before, and that has resulted in good content improvement initiatives and product improvement initiatives. And we continue, look forward to continue this engagement to further improve uh, customer success with self-service. As I mentioned earlier, we are actively working on in-product support through our digital support APIs to allow our customers to access support from within the product, whether it is uh, software downloads or license refreshes or searching our digital properties for content or creating a case all within the, uh, all within the interface of the product. We don't want our customers to leave the product in, in, uh, interface to uh, you know, access support offerings. We're also working very closely with the product documentation teams on various initiatives, and one of them is to ensure that support documentation referenced, referenced within product documentation does not lead to any dead ends for our customers. We also plan to extend our KCS knowledge management strategies to organizations outside of support, especially to organizations that we feel will benefit from this methodology. And we plan to continue with our improvements in optimizing uh, our, our knowledge base uh, to continue to drive our shift left strategy. Again, just reminding, just to remind the, uh, you, you all about what our shift left strategy is. It is uh, to shift cases from our assisted support channel to digital channels of support for self-serviceable solutions and have customers contact traditional support only for new and complex problems. 
And that brings us to the end of our presentation. And I just want to stop here at this slide just to reinforce our content health practices and strategies to see that if there are any questions that I can answer that has already not been answered by my team members on chat. All right, so if you could uh, continue to put your questions in chat, but um, if then, I don't know if your team could bring in any of the unanswered ones. Are there any unanswered ones? Uh, I think almost all the questions have been answered. Okay, great. Thank you, team. Any other questions that I can Hi. answer? Hi, Padma, this is Libby. This was so fascinating. Thank you so much for walking us through this. It's really, sure. really impressive. And I apologize if this was answered in the chat. The chat has been so busy. I'll have you know, during your presentation, it's been crazy. Um, one of the things, so we are starting an initiative around um, the Evolve Loop and around uh, bringing our KDEs and our SMEs in um, kind of more officially. And one thing that my managers are asking for is an ROI um, or some way to measure the impact that their KDEs um, or that their SMEs are having on content. Have you started to look into any kind of feedback to managers on what kind of return on investment you get from asking for that like increase in time? Uh, specifically for content or for other initiatives, because we have been able to show a return on investment in the KDA work with respect to product enhancements and, you know, finding uh, some cool ways to uh, reduce cases. So that way we have been showing a big impact of our KDA work. Uh, in these areas. When it comes to content, it is a little challenging, although we do try to show uh, how our content, um, you know, how, we, how, we, how we've been able to um, improve the engagement of our content or how our content has, uh, you know, been in, uh, how we've been able to improve our, uh, uh, you know, position of our content on Google search. Those are the things we track and we try to show that. But content improvements are a little more harder to show, but KDA activities have actually resulted in improvements in many other areas, like I said, uh, you know, uh, product improvements, and uh, in some cases, we've radically brought down case volume in certain areas. So those kind of improvements we've been able to show. Oh, those are great suggestions. Thank you so much. Sure. Hi, I have a question. Um, I have a couple of questions, actually, and I may have missed it. Um, what platform are your knowledge articles stored in? So we are, uh, our knowledge articles are so, uh, stored on CX1 expert platform. It was earlier called MindTouch and it's a KCS V6 verified platform. It's, it's a, I would say it's a really good platform, very uh, easy to use editor and it has, uh, it, it, it is, it allows us to do a lot of innovations on the platform simply uh, because of the way uh, it is, um, uh, because of the backend, uh, you know, backend uh, work that we can do with the platform. So it's a great platform that uh, we have invested in and we are uh, seeing a lot of the benefits of the platform. So it's CX1 Expert, it was initially called MyTouch. Okay, that's great. Um, the other thing is user feedback and that's something that we have struggled with because we've made it optional. We have three forms of feedback being that you can select the article, you can click whether the article is useful or not, um, and then the third form being the ratings. Um, the struggle that we have is because it's voluntary, um, we don't always get uh, a lot of feedback from a lot of the users. Is that a challenge that you guys have um, noticed? And if so, how have you kind of closed the gap on that challenge? We, we actually have not noticed any challenge in getting feedback because, like I said, we've made it very easy for our customers to give us feedback through our feedback widget. So we get a lot of feedback on our articles by our users, uh, both our internal users and our external users. Uh, also, like I was mentioning earlier, the fact that we respond to feedback, especially uh, customer feedback within 48 hours, has uh, increased, uh, you know, the number of feedback that we've been getting. I think it's important for our customers to know that we are actively listening to what they're saying. Uh, we are actively looking at their usage of our site, and when they provide us with feedback, we uh, make sure that it gets answered and we, uh, you know, send that information back to our customers. In fact, when we answer a customer, 
customer feedback a mail goes out to the customer letting them know that their feedback has been addressed and we give them the link to the uh, updated article so uh, probably in our old when we were in the old database this could have been a challenge we were not receiving too many feedback also because we were not addressing them the way we are addressing today there were a lot of pending feedback in our old system today because we are addressing feedback at such a rapid rate it's becoming uh, you know we are actually getting a lot of feedback in fact uh, we address close to 200, 250 feedback in a month, and that is done uh, as a collaborative effort between the KB team, uh, that is the uh, Evolve Loop Programs team, and the KDA team. And I, I see Tony thank you Melendez. Very much. Oh, thank you. I see Tony Melendez has his hand up. Tony, you want to answer yes. ask a question? Yeah, th thank you. So uh, again, also I'm enjoying the presentation. I'm with uh, Hitachi Ventara. So uh, I guess two questions. The first question is, what, what is your CRM? Uh, we we are SAP. SAP. Okay. So, uh, in your integration with MindTouch, uh, are you uh, how are you handling the uh, reporting on that? I know. Um, uh, are you tracking? Is MindTouch delivering the you know, participation rate or authorship? And and how are you handling or managing or tracking your uh, metrics in uh, out of MindTouch? Yeah, so MindTouch does have certain uh, inbuilt uh, reports that we use, uh, but we also have Adobe uh, that we use for some of our uh, reporting purposes. Uh, we have Adobe integration into MindTouch and even uh, in our touch points, right, where we've integrated MindTouch into our CRM, we do have reports coming in from uh, Adobe and uh, we, we also have uh, Covio in, uh, integrated into our uh, CRM and NSS, plat our support side platform, so we get uh, reports from there as well. So that's how we manage, uh, we get reports from various sources to know how uh, I, I, the usability of us, how, how uh, to understand the usage of us. Sorry. Lots of integration. Uh, final question. Uh, what's your better, best uh, qualitative metric um, in terms of uh, activities, one thing, but how do you measure the value of your article uh, content? Like I, there are, I think, I think there are many things that we look at. Uh, if you look at the value of content that our uh, customer support uh, engineers are creating, we have a measure which is our content standard checklist that tells us the quality of the content that's going into the database. If we look at, you know, um, the uh, if you look at the customer side, right, where the customers are finding value in our content, we look at the one of the measures we look at, like I said, is that 85 85 rule where we look at, you know, how many of our customers started their journey on the support side and how many of them have. Uh, Got, uh, have been successful uh, by, through their journey on the support side. And today we stand at 60%. And as I said, that is a conservative measure because it's a sampled uh, number that we get, a sampled percentage that we get there. So these are uh, two primary measures that we look at when we look at the quality of our content. Well, thank you. And then another another measure is, of course, our, um, our CTR that we get on our, 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 on our sites. Uh, thank you again. And then Saeed? Uh, Ali has his hand up. Sid. Hi, good morning. I, I'm Sid, and I, I, yeah, thank you for, first of all, thank you for uh, th this time. It's been fascinating because my company's going down a very similar journey um, as what you've gone through. And I, I have two questions, if you don't mind. The first one was, how did you land on that 20% in terms of the content you wanted to migrate or rebuild essentially in the new uh, KM platform? Was there some thought that went into it? Was there data that helped you uh, kind of arrive at that metric? Absolutely, absolutely. We spent, I think, uh, and Mohan here was the one who spearheaded the entire work here. Uh, we actually spent a lot of time trying to figure out what is the right content that we want to migrate. So we looked at the top viewed articles. We looked at articles which were used very often to solve cases. And we looked at it per vertical. We didn't take an uh, uh, overall approach. We didn't look at total number of articles and which are the articles that, are high, that have high views or high citations. We looked at it per vertical. And we also took into account how many articles Articles are there in that vertical to make very informed decisions on, you know, uh, which article needs to be moved into the new database. That was our first attempt. That was done by the Evolve team, and then we also ran this list by our uh, subject matter experts, our who are now our KDA team. Uh, earlier they were uh, our TSEs. Uh, we ran it by them and they actually wetted that list and there was a lot of additions and deletions. And then that is when we finally arrived at the number of articles that we thought uh, we could move into the new system. It took a lot of effort, believe me. It took at least two to three months for us to arrive at that number of uh, you know, 5,000 articles that we thought were the best articles to move into the new database. 
I'm, I'm fascinated by that because we have like 6,000 plus articles that I'm looking at. I'm like, okay, this is a lot of work. So I love the way that you approached it and the way that you organized a team to help support it. Uh, my second comment was, the question was more about that team. You had mentioned you shifted the collective, the uh, flag management essentially to a collective group. Uh, was there a technology upgrade or was that a in the box solution that allowed you to do that? Or did you have to utilize some technology upgrades in order to allow others to kind of manage that flag feedback? Yeah, like I was telling earlier, the feedback, uh, uh, the, the feedback loop or the feedback workflow that we, uh, we I just showed you was completely built by my team in collaboration with the KCS team and with our IT team. Only thing that we got from MindTouch was a way to flag an art, uh, to, to give an art, uh, give a feedback on that article and that feedback would come to, uh, like I said, a predetermined uh, email ID, right? So it used to come to our editors and then uh, only thing we could do is look at that and then send it out to respective folks to uh, address. But this team came up with a very innovative uh, way where we could pull all this information from the, um, uh, you know, uh, from our uh, uh, email box and then put it into a uh, uh, into a system from where we could then uh, feed it into our uh, feedback dashboard and from there our team actually assigns uh, feedback that is not addressed to our KDA team to look into and some some of the feedback my team addresses themselves and then of course we worked with our IT team to build those integrations where uh, through the CRM you know uh, users alerted uh, 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 technical support engineers alerted of a pending feedback on an article so it was all custom built there was nothing that we got out of the box. Thank you so much for your time I appreciate it. Hi, Padma. Uh, Prashant, the site. So uh, as a follow-up to this, um, you know, feedback conversation we are having, I think feedback is the most crucial as aspect of whatever we do in KCS, right? Uh, first thing, I, I, I'm interested to know on an average, how what's the number inflow influx of the feedback we receive from customers on the content? Uh, but, uh, you're just looking at customers, not... Right, because just the customers. Get, I, I think, and uh, I think Mohan here can correct me, but we do get about you know, six to seven in, on a daily basis. On a daily basis, okay. Um, that That's good. I mean, it's not a bad number. It's, it's good that customers uh, are indulging, right? So this this is a positive side to it. Uh, moving on to the other side of feedback, which actually comes from our power audits and everything. So Toma did try to, uh, you know, provide me some information, but I am I'm still not able to understand the piece. Uh, like he said, the coaches, uh, what they will do is if they find any opportunity, they would go ahead and provide the coaching. And in the next time they would follow up and see if the agent has really improvised and they are you know, putting in their best efforts to adhere to the process. But let's say in the very first instance, if through the audit, we have found that there was opportunity to create a new content. Now, like Tomer explained, the coach is not supposed to do that, right? They are supposed to do coaching then the opportunity we find to close the knowledge gap, where does that flows in? Who is supposed to act on that? That's a good question. Actually, um, uh, what we uh, what we hope to happen is like once once we see that there is uh, you know a, a knowledge gap that has come in as part of case closure and the and we do sampling right our power, power is not done on every case that is uh, that comes to the support center it's a sample but we do give that coaching back to our um, technical support engineers telling them that you know uh, there has been a miss or you have a missed uh, create opportunity they could probably go back and if that particular case was audited and there was a create opportunity for that case and then if the coach has actually coached the TSC about that they could probably go back and solve the case which uh, maybe doesn't happen all the time but the idea is that the next time they will ensure that there is no capture loss uh, happening in the case in between there was a time we would, when we thought that we could actually look at all the capture losses and have some team actually address it but it doesn't work that way on we, we usually can't do that very often or very um, effectively right. after that the case is uh, completed so we try to give coaching as much as possible to make sure that the next time around the you know the TSC doesn't miss that and then it becomes a part of their uh, you know muscle memory to uh, ensure that they create a case when there's an opportunity to sort of create a KB when there's an opportunity to create a KB or improve a KB when there's an opportunity to improve a KB. And uh, yeah, that's how we've been doing things. Understand, understand. I mean, something, you know, uh, we are also trying to navigate through. So that's that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, because it's it's a it's a sample, right? If, if we wouldn't know right. all the KBs that they've missed and all the things that they've done, but it's coaching to ensure that in the future they do, they do not miss uh, such opportunities. Yep, agree. Thanks.
All right, were there any questions in chat that we've missed? You guys have been doing an incredible job on chat, so I'm not seeing any, but any that you'd like to bring up? Which is the size of the sample, the power sample, I think. We do about 10%, around 10%, uh, uh, you know, of power sampling for, uh, for the cases that have been closed in a, in a, in a month. That, that's what we usually do, about 10%, more or less. Hi, Padma, Mathieu here from Oracle NetSuite. May, if I may have one question, it is actually about the content quality. I already asked uh, via chat uh, if you are applying any uh, automation on the content quality, uh, and I understood that uh, you are not. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically, you are using some, let's say, content quality index or something similar to measure the quality of the articles, or you are not doing it at all? No, no, we are. We have a content standard checklist uh, and we have certain criteria on which we audit content and that audit has, uh, happens on a monthly basis as well. Again, it's a sample audit. We take sample of articles that are written in a particular month by our, uh, uh, our, by our uh, technical, sub technical support engineers and the uh, coaches go ahead and audit that article based on a, a preset, uh, pre uh, you know, a, a set criteria which, where we look at the customer context, whether the links are appropriate, whether the formatting is good. So there are uh, various criteria that we look in to see that the content that is going out is of good quality. And as I said earlier, our content standard, content standard checklist uh, percentage is 90% or about across choose uh, for the content that we are creating through the solid loop. Thank you. Thank you for answering it. And uh, can you please tell me uh, oh, what is the size of that sample? Would you know? Uh, Again, like I said, we try to get at least uh, one or two articles written by our technical support engineers on a monthly basis to, uh, to the audit sample. So that works out about okay. 8 to 10 percent. Yeah. 8 to 10 percent. OK, thank Around. you. Around. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, one more question. Uh, this one is related to the chatbot. Um, how the chatbot is actually, um, or how to say, it, uh, how you are working with the with the content used for the chatbot? Is it basically looking into the whole knowledge base, or are you uh, designing some questions, uh, like predefined questions for the chatbot? I think uh, we do have predefined questions that the chatbot looks into before it shows the information that it is showing. And this information could be from the knowledge base, could be from our product documentation. So the chatbot database has all this information, right? Uh, and, and we don't, uh, the, uh, the chatbot is only for a certain spare set of products. It doesn't cover the entire product range of NetApp, right? We do have our chatbot working only for a certain set of products. So there are answers, there are KB articles in, in the chatbot database, product documentation in the chatbot database. And based on the questions that uh, uh, you know a customer asks and i wouldn't call it a predefined set of questions they are intense there's something called uh, intents and entities and based on the intent of the uh, uh, person who's asking the question or the customer who's asking the question we show the right answer if it is there in our database if it is not there then we direct that user to uh, live chat mm -hmm. so basically you don't need to take care about uh, some quality in terms of the content for the chatbot you are we taking do. care about the knowledge base like uh, we, overall or mm -hmm. go ahead the quality Sorry. of the knowledge base or the chatbot yeah i was asking if if you somehow um also uh, focus on the quality on the of the chatbot or you are basically focusing only on the quality of the knowledge base from where the uh, data are taken both, or the chatbot. Both. Oh, like I was oh. telling you earlier, there is a, a there is a, a part of my team that actually works on sustenance activities where they look at customer interactions with the bot, uh, with the chatbot, and try to keep uh, making improvements to the answer that we serve and our, and to ensure that our success rate continues to increase as far as uh, the answers that are coming from our chatbot is concerned. Perfect. Thank you very much for the answers. Sure. And I saw a few more coming in that looks like you have addressed, there was a, a question about um, case deflection. And I think you shared more how you are not doing case deflection more, but up leveling it to your contact ratio and your success and such. Yes. Any, you want to elaborate on that at all or? Uh, yeah, so this is something that uh, I think uh, prior to KCSV6, we were focused a lot on case deflection. We're not so anymore. Uh, we look at success uh, based on, uh, you know, how many people are coming to our digital properties and using our digital properties to 
solve their issues. And like I was telling earlier, another metric that we actually look, is, uh, look at is cost per answer, where we try to uh, give a monetary value to the case, uh, the, to the answers that are given on our different, uh, you know, um, uh, support channels, right? So we have moved uh, the focus from case deflection because there are so many other things that we look into to, um, uh, to evaluate the success of our cases program. Case deflection uh, probably doesn't come into our verbiage anymore because of these other channels, uh, other other metrics that we're looking at, uh, you know, like contact ratio and um, see, uh, cost per answer. That's great. And we'd love to underscore that, that at the from a consortium standpoint, we're trying to get away from case deflection because that's very supply centric and rather shifting to the customer and their issue. And as Padma said, the various channels that that issue can be resolved in and driving it to the optimal channel. So getting away from case as the currency and more of that customer issue and, and how it's being resolved and that cost per answer as Padma showed. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's not that we don't want our customers to contact us. They should contact us when they need to contact us, right? To assisted support, but we also want them to contact us to, you know, try our digital channels of support uh, to get information. Like, like I said, our shift lift strategy. We want them to come to our digital uh, channels to get answers for uh, questions that you know are self-solvable, and come to uh, assisted support only for the those crucial uh, answers that they need, which they cannot find on our self-support. Hi Padma, Prashant here again. <laughs> uh, just just a quick one. Actually, I was wondering um, on two three slides back there was a um, you know a row item ninety five percent positive feedback uh, for the site. So when we say uh, for the website, I, I think it was website or maybe not. So is, is it the same support portal we have like where customer can come in and you know, uh, they can browse for products, purchases, and everything, or that 95% of positive feedback that customers are satisfied was specific to the knowledge portal. Uh, the, I think you're talking about uh, the 98% and 96% that I spoke about quality of the right. site. Right. 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 Yeah, that is yes. for all our properties. It's an overall uh, percentage for all our three uh, properties, right, which is our support site, our KB site, and our community site. It's not just specific for the KBC. Got it, got it, thank you. All right, well, thank you so much. This was an incredible presentation, incredible delivery, and thanks for the entire team. That was the most impressive chat responses that I think we've ever seen at a KCS in action. So you guys did awesome.